remember why you're here. You remember why you're here? You're here to see John Franklin, right? You've seen him on the circle. Please give a fantastic welcome to Mr. John Franklin. Jersey. Glad to be taping my special in my home state, folks. I am so happy to be here. So happy to be here. So as we've discussed, as you guys know, my name is John Franklin. It's a two-name name, ladies and gentlemen. Two-name name. My whole life never had a nickname growing up. That was a bummer. Gotta tell you, I was really upset my whole life. John Franklin, John Franklin, sometimes Franklin. That guy called me a disappointment once, but he's my dad, so that's cool. <laughs> it's totally fine, but I never had a nickname growing up. But you know, as I thought about it, as I got older, I was okay with it. Because I started to realize, like, high school nicknames are mean. You know what I mean? High school nicknames are really mean. Did you ever think about the nicknames kids had when you went to high school? These are three real nicknames of people I went to high school with, and they responded to these names for four years. There was Dick Cheese, there was Splooge, and we just called one kid Shitty, and he answered for four years. Four years, isn't that crazy? I don't know, but I grew up in New Jersey. I'm born and raised in New Jersey. Anybody else? I love it. You guys are from New Jersey? Yes, sir. All right, now we're going to talk for a second. Here's the deal, folks. I'm a comedian, not a magician, but there's something that I like to do at every set to see with people who are from New Jersey. I've performed a lot of places. This seems to only be a thing with New Jersey people. Folks, what are your names? Travis. Travis? All right, Travis. We're in this together, Travis. Are you with me, Travis? We're sticking together. Absolutely. All right, Travis. Here's the deal. You grew up in New Jersey. Yes, sir. Born and raised where? Carney, New Jersey. Great to clap it up for Carney, New Jersey. Clap it up for Carney, New Jersey. All right, I'm picturing your parents' house right now. I need you to go back in time and picture your parents' house. You got it? Okay, where you grew up. You had two refrigerators in that house, didn't you? No, I didn't. You did not? No. Somebody else from New Jersey, can help me out here. You, right there. What's your name? Julia. Julia? It's nice to meet you. All right, Travis. <laughs> Julia is going to help me out. That's not what we're after. We're not after, I'm not asking for marital status. I'm asking for a second refrigerator, Travis. Julia, two refrigerators in your house. All right, that second refrigerator, was it in your basement or your garage? Basement refrigerator, okay. There was, it was a fridge-freezer combo, right? Yeah, the fridge part was just like a little bit of produce and mostly drinks. Yeah, and then the freezer was all meat and a box of ice cream for when kids came over, right? There you go, and that's how you know you're from New Jersey, Travis. That's how you know you're from New Jersey. It's true, I love living in New Jersey, though, guys. I live in Hoboken, New Jersey now. I love Hoboken, man. Hudson County, baby. Hoboken, New Jersey. I love Hoboken. A lot of crazy stuff happens in Hoboken, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tell you about it right now, all right? The other day, I was going to get lunch on my lunch break, as one does when they get lunch on your lunch break, you know? And I was walking to get lunch on my lunch break, and I'm going to Mamoon's Falafel. Yeah. Okay. And, not a sponsor. And I'm going to get Mamoon's Falafel. Come out, and there's a white guy having a cigarette next to a black lady. It's important, stick with me. And they're talking. The white guy ashes his cigarette, gets all over this black lady's shoulder. She starts screaming and yelling, giving this guy the business. And I am just the captive audience with a bag of falafel. It's just my day. And they're yelling at each other. She's yelling at him. Finally lands on calling this guy the N-word. And he goes, don't call me that. To which this lady has the greatest response 
in an altercation I've ever heard in my life. She goes, call you what? <laughs> and it should have ended there. But this guy freaks out and he just goes, that word, don't call me that word. And she let him have it. Two hands by her side. And she went, say it! <laughs> and he was so afraid, he ran away into a Panera bread. <laughs> Hadn't even eaten lunch that day. Man, Panera bread. You know what I don't like, guys? There are two things I don't like right now, okay? I gotta tell you about it. Number one, don't like when people misuse the saying, long story short. <laughs> Fuck them. Fuck them. I hate people who do that. Because they tell you a long story. And at the end, they just pepper in long story short. As if you didn't just listen to the whole thing. Fucking stupid. The second thing that I can't stand is fast food getting too cute. You noticed this recently? You see this? Panera's got pizza. It's crazy. Burger King sells a chicken parm sandwich. <laughs> the next thing we know, McDonald's is going to be selling the McMeatloaf. We're all going to be eating family style. It's the next step. I think we can all agree, though, the biggest mistake fast food ever did was start putting calorie counts on things. You think we give a shit? Do you? Honestly. Have you ever seen the calorie count on your McDonald's order and went, I'm gonna get a salad now instead? <laughs> Never once. It's just a high score mechanism at this point, as far as I'm concerned. I know I'm disgusting. I didn't need a McDonald's kiosk at three in the morning to tell me that a Big Mac, a friggin' large fry, and a McFlurry with M&M's is 2,100 calories. I did not need to know that. And that's the number, by the way. I didn't need to know that for the rest of my life. And like, it's fine. I think that's fine. It's fine they want to do that. But there is one fast food place that I think probably should change, but just doesn't. And that's Chick-fil-A. They stand by who they are at all times. That's fine, because I like their chicken sandwich. I gotta be honest with you guys, I don't care. I like their chicken sandwich. Steak rolls on Sunday, that's fine. That's fine. But I went to school for journalism, okay? This all connects, I promise. I went to school for journalism. And I chose to do that because I liked the movie Anchorman. <laughs> Poor life choice. Because everybody, every teacher in a journalism school at college is offended all the time. They like being offended, they like being upset. One time, I was going to a 400 level journalism class my senior year. And I'm going to class, and there were food trucks on campus. One of them was Chick-fil-A. So I decided to stop and get a Chick-fil-A sandwich. I took it to class to eat it in class. I didn't even unwrap the paper before my teacher just went, that a Chick-fil-A sandwich? I said, yes, it is. She goes, do you know what Chick-fil-A stands for? I said, I always thought it was chicken filet. <laughs> she did not like that one bit. She didn't like it at all. Because she said, no, they're a bunch of racists and homophobes. And if you eat that sandwich, it makes you a racist and a homophobe. I was like, whoa, <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I can't eat this sandwich. <laughs> so in a fit of panic, I decided to call my close best friend, Jake, who happens to be gay, and put him on speakerphone, because I decided she called me out so I could phone a friend. I figured that's how that worked. <laughs> so I called Jake, I said, hey Jake, it's John. He said, hey John, it's Jake, you know, like a phone call. And, and I was like, listen man, do you know what Chick-fil-A stands for? He said, I always thought it was chicken filet. <laughs> I was like, no, man. Apparently, there are a bunch of racists and homophobes, and if I eat this sandwich I have right now, it makes me a racist and a homophobe. 
To which Jake went, oh, there's Chick-fil-A on campus right now? <laughs> I said, yeah, man, there is. He went, I would totally blow you if you pick up one of those sandwiches for me <laughs> on your way home. Oh, yeah, journalism school, that was fun, man. It didn't prepare me to get a job whatsoever, I gotta be honest with you. The job hunt is the worst thing to ever exist in the history of the world. It is the worst. Finding the job is the stupidest thing ever. It is, because nobody understands how it works, generationally speaking. According to my parents, this is how finding a job worked. You just showed up at a building. And you went, I want a job. And they said, okay, great. What do you want to do? And you're like, I want to be the CEO. And I'm like, all right, you're a go-getter. Go for it, man. <laughs> Getting a job now is nothing like that. You interview eight times over the course of six months for a two-month internship. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I interviewed for so many jobs, so many jobs. I still remember the worst job interview I ever went on. It's awful. Started talking to this guy, things are going well. I'm feeling good. You know, it was a Zoom interview, it was preliminary. And he looks at me and he's like, what's one job you wish you never had? Now, he meant on my resume. I thought he meant in the history of the world forever. <laughs> because I said, oh, would have been terrible if I was the guy guarding the tomb when Jesus rose. <laughs> have you ever said something so incredibly stupid <laughs> that people just don't know what to say back? Because there was a lot of radio silence on that conversation that day, and I panicked. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, are you not Catholic? <laughs> I did not get the job at Omaha Steaks, ladies and gentlemen. I did not get that job. But I did get a job, eventually. I have a job I really like now, as a matter of fact. I really like my job. I've been celebrating two years at that job today. Yeah, health benefits, that's cool. No, I like my job, I really do. I enjoy my job. I have a great time in my job. I work in sports and entertainment. It's really cool, sports and entertainment, to work in sports and entertainment, because I like sports and entertainment. You know, sports and entertainment. And I like it, it's a lot of fun. And one thing I get to do is cover the NFL all season long. I love the NFL, man. Any other football fans here who like the NFL? <laughs> love the NFL, love the NFL. There's something about the NFL, though, that's a little strange to me. I've been watching the NFL a lot the last couple of years, and I noticed something. On the sidelines, in big capital letters, they just print the words, end racism. On the sidelines. It got me thinking, what racist guy is in like Louisiana watching the Saints on a Sunday? He sees them play and they score a touchdown. He sees the words, end racism. And he's like, Honey, take down the flag. <laughs> Change your shit up around here. No, I like my job. Like I said, I've been there for two years. I still remember my first week on the job at this job. And I remember doing icebreakers. Man, I hate icebreakers. Does anybody like icebreakers? I feel like it's a crazy thing to like. I like, I hate them. Icebreakers are awful. And I remember going through like the process of like doing icebreakers at this job. And because it's sports, I decided I would try to like make it relatable. So I said, growing up, I played soccer, and I did theater. That was my fun fact about myself. Growing up, I played soccer, and I did theater. And a lady over teams was super weird about it. She was like, but were you like the back Efron of your high school? <laughs> were you like the Troy Bolton? Did you like, did you like the dribble dribble swish swish? And I was like, you don't know how soccer works. <laughs> At all. And also, unless Troy Bolton played Papa Bear and Shrek the Musical and rode the bench in high school soccer, 
I don't think we did the same thing, you know, <laughs> at all. And as a guy, he was super weird. People were always saying like, hey, John, if you were like the only straight guy in theater, you must have been getting laid all the time. I'm like, first of all, Craig, this is a weird work conversation. <laughs> Second of all, I don't think any women ever have ever thought, you know what's really hot? A guy that could do a box step and land it on a jazz hand. I don't think that's ever <laughs> come across to them, ever. And the thing is, when you do theater in high school, you're gay until proven straight. That's really what it is. This is a natural assumption. I remember I was at a party once. Things were going well with the girl. Leaned in to make a move. And she stopped, put a hand on my chest, and said, but wait, John, you're gay. <laughs> I was like, oh, you think so? <laughs> the last couple of years have been really confusing. I'm really not sure anymore. But I do remember being somebody who enjoyed musicals. I finally found a friend who also enjoyed musicals. I loved it. We used to make a plan every Thursday after school that we would watch a musical together. Adorable. And we would go to his house. It was like our Manhattan Project, guys. He would show up in my locker with a note and it would just say the musical. It would be like, rent. I would be like, cool, that's what we're watching today. I remember one day we were going to watch Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> Love Jesus Christ Superstar. And also, by the way, we didn't speak when we did this. It was completely silent when we watched these musicals. Because if you say something with another man while you're watching a musical, it's too much like a date. <laughs> like, it's too close. You know, like, when you're watching a football game with a friend, you're like, hey, man, wow, that was a great throw, what a catch, things like that. That's fine. If you're sitting there with your friend and you go, wow, his vibrato is truly haunting. <laughs> Change the vibe pretty quick, doesn't it? <laughs> pretty quick. I remember we were watching Jesus Christ Superstar and I was getting really into this movie, this musical, Jesus Christ Superstar, man. And my dad pulled up out front of the house before the last scene of the musical and started beeping his horn to get me to come out and leave. Just laying on the horn. So I was like, I gotta watch the end. So I poked my head out of the front door of my friend's house and I yelled, there's one scene left in Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> you know, for the neighborhood to hear. And he looked at me and through his car window yelled, you know how it ends, he dies, get in the car. <laughs> My dad's a cool guy. My dad's a really cool guy. I like my dad because he gives really cool advice. He like he does this thing where he gives really specific advice. Do you know, like your dad's advice? There's like there's a general advice, but when your dad gives advice, it's very close to life experiences that he's had. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of relatable, not really. These are the three pieces of pieces of advice. My dad used to give me growing up. Number one, never date a red-headed Italian woman. <laughs> Number two, if anyone pays for something on your behalf, don't ask any questions and accept it. <laughs> that one's pretty good. That one's all right. And number three is if you ever see him running, do not assume he's exercising. Assume you should also be running. <laughs> oh man, my birthday was yesterday, huh? That's crazy. Woo! Man. It's weird, it's weird. Like, I'm getting older, man. I am, I'm getting older. Things are changing. I'm not old yet, but I'm getting older. You know what I mean? You get different responsibilities each year. You know? I'm starting to realize, like, being an adult, being an adult, it's just like a weird thing. It is. It is a weird thing. Like money, I thought would be cool. But I have to spend it way more now than I have it. Do you know what I mean? It's crazy. Like things just go wrong now that you have money. Like cool, I have a salary. And then you like hit your toe the wrong way on the sidewalk and it's a $10,000 surgery. <laughs> this would never happen in college. 
And then the other thing, too, is like, you get a lot of mail you don't want. You get a ton of mail that you don't want. I am pre-approved for every credit card in the country, <laughs> according to my mailbox. And if those two things come together, the money and the mail, that's called a bill, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's called a bill. And bills are the worst. <laughs> bills are the worst. I hate paying them. They're terrible. I was recently in a dispute with a company over a bill. And now this is being recorded. So I don't really want to use their real name because I don't want to get in a lot of trouble. So we're going to go ahead and call them LabCorp. And <laughs> LabCorp and I are not on good terms. I got a bill from LabCorp for $51.79. Whatever, I'll pay it, fine. Paid it, got rid of it, kept getting that bill in the mail over and over and over after I paid it. But I was like, I paid this, so I'm gonna ignore this, as a normal human does, until you get a mail, a letter in the mail, from a collections agency for $51.79. So you call LabCorp, and you get on the phone with a woman named Alejandra. <laughs> and Alejandra was nice, she was fine, and I explained to her I had already paid this bill, Alejandra, in full. So the page says, yes, sir, I see that it's reflecting on your account. And I said, great, could you please tell the credit collections company that I paid this bill in full? She said, no, sir, I'm not allowed to do that. And I said, why? She said, we cannot contact the credit collections company on your behalf. I was like, Alejandro, I have some questions about your job. <laughs> Number one, you have been billing me for a bill that I paid for months, correct? She said, yes, that's correct. I said, Number two, after finding out that I paid this bill, you're telling me you cannot contact the credit collections company that you've already contacted on my behalf, again, not being able to contact it on my behalf, right, to rectify it? She goes, correct, sir, that's correct. So I said, Alejandra, do you like your job? <laughs> she said, yes, sir, I do enjoy my job. Will that be all for today? I was like, can I get a receipt for that payment? Could that be fine? She's like, yeah, I'd like send you a receipt. You could send it to the credit collections company. It'll all work out. So that sounds great. Send me the credit collections receipt, and it says John Ernest Franklin. That's my dad's name. So I called my dad. I said, hey, dad, I've been getting billed by LabCorp for $51.79, and I paid it. But they're sending me to credit collections. You owe me $51.79. And he said, John, what am I going to tell you? If someone pays for something on your behalf, <laughs> you don't ask questions and you accept it. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> you know what's an interesting part about my life now, folks? I'm on Cameo. Isn't that crazy? Like, you could pay $20 to have me say whatever you want. It's ridiculous. People have had me told people that they're pregnant. Why me? Why do you want me to tell you that? But people ask me all the time, John, you're on Cameo. You ever done a bad Cameo? I'm like, no, I've never done a bad Cameo. But I have a standard. And his name is John Ratzenberger. You guys know John Ratzenberger? John Ratzenberger played Cliff in Cheers, the voice of several, several Pixar characters. Very famous guy. I have a friend who has a nephew that loves cars. And he wanted to get a cameo from John Ratzenberger just pretending to be the voice of Mac the Truck and wish his nephew, Iggy, a happy birthday. That's all he asked for and what he got was a, a minute and 13 seconds of a drunk mess. And oh boy, we're about to listen to it together. Hey Iggy, John Ratzenberger here. Uh, you may not understand this being four years old, but I supply the voice of Mac the truck. Uh, look at all those sleeping trucks. Yeah, that's when uh, you see Mac speak on the screen with Bader and Lightning and all those guys. And it's my voice he's speaking with. So 
guys who uh, Lightning and Mater and every, everybody over there at uh, Car Town. <laughs> uh, Radiator Springs, that's what it's called. Okay, and say hi to your, your brother Harvey and your sister Tilly. Uh, you know, because birthdays, you know, the whole family takes part. And blow out the candles, make a good wish, eat a lot of cake and ice cream. All right, pal. Happy fourth birthday. Take care. Couple of things with that. Car Town? You were in the movie several times. There are sequels. It's Radiator Springs. Number two, he is so fucked up. Like, he is messed up. Do you hear that man's voice? Horrifying. But we can all agree that was a better gift than an edible arrangement. I hate edible arrangements. I got an edible arrangement for my birthday a couple of years ago from a friend who's now an enemy. And I hate edible arrangements. You want to know why I hate edible arrangements? This is why I hate edible arrangements. This is what it's like when you get an edible arrangement. First of all, your friend knows nothing about you at all. Their base knowledge of you is you like fruit shaped like flowers. They just think that's it. And then you get the edible arrangement. Do you know what it's like? You get a knock at your door and you open it up and you're like, oh wow, fruit. And you take it and you're like, now I don't know what to do because I have to store this. I have to store an edible arrangement in my refrigerator. So you're a 25 year old man at the time, hypothetically, and you're like trying to figure out how to fit the edible arrangement into your fridge. And like, you wanna maintain the structural integrity of the arrangement, you know? Cause like, it's really nice. It's an edible arrangement, it's beautiful. You don't wanna take it apart, put it in the Tupperware. You wanna leave it in the bouquet as it comes. So you're like, you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to shove it in your own one knee in the produce drawer, you know? You're like trying to figure out some space. And your roommate, your roommate, he comes out of his room. And he's like, I don't know what this is, but I better get out of here. So he leaves you alone on your birthday. And you're trying to figure out how to fit an edible arrangement in your fridge. And you come to the slow but sad realization that you're going to have to eat the entire edible arrangement. 44 pieces of assorted fruit, mostly melon, mostly melon. Because they never nail the ratio on an edible arrangement. So you're sitting there on your sectional alone on your birthday, eating so many pieces of fruit, and there's no TV on because you don't want to see the news. You're not checking your phone because your birthday's January 6th because you don't want to deal with that shit at all. So you're just eating this edible arrangement on your couch alone with Loggins and Messina playing in the background. And finally, your roommate comes back. He comes back and he says, how's it going? And on the brink of tears, you muster up enough strength to say, there's so much pineapple. I'm in therapy. I'm in, I'm in therapy. I like therapy, man. I do. I like therapy. I like being therapized. The worst thing about therapy is when you have to end things with a therapist, when you're going to get a new therapist. Getting a new therapist is terrible. Breaking up with a therapist is awful because they know more about you than any significant other you've ever had because you're actually 100% honest the whole time in that relationship. I had to break up with a therapist recently. I called her. And I said, Kathy, you know, things haven't been working out. I think I'm going to go on, work with somebody else. I just don't feel like I'm growing as a person. And she said, John, this is exactly what I'm talking about with your commitment issues. <laughs> Which was a really unfair thing to say. <laughs> because now I have two therapists. <laughs> I like being in a relationship though. I do have a girlfriend now, I have a girlfriend now. She's great. I love my girlfriend, she's amazing. One thing I don't love about my girlfriend are the products in her shower. There are so many products in a woman's shower that I don't understand. I don't get any of it. There are so many things. I mean, none of them say what they are at all. They like say hydrating, sculpting, whatever it is. Like it starts to sound like Bruce Springsteen introducing the E Street Band. <laughs> you never understand what anything is. I one time used a bar of soap in her shower and I came out and she said, what did you wash yourself with? I said, the bar of soap. And she said, I don't have a bar of soap in my shower. I said, what was that? She goes, that's a shampoo bar. <laughs> the hell is that? What is a shampoo bar? 
Men, men, we have the 12 in one, ladies and gentlemen. We rely on this. It comes in a bright neon green bottle. It is everything you need, and it says it. Shampoo, conditioner, body wash, face wash, de deodorant. It'll probably do your taxes for you, okay? It probably will. I have no idea what's going on in her shower half the time. I am so confused by it, but I do enjoy being in the relationship, I promise. I enjoy being in the relationship. I like, like, I like doing like relationship things. I'm a relationship guy. I like, it, the thing is like, people are always like, well, John, now that you're in a relationship, don't you ever miss like the rush of like betting a new woman every night when you go out? I'm like, dad, calm down. And, <laughs> You guys take your time on that. And <laughs> but I don't miss one night stands at all. I was bad at one night stands. I remember the worst one night stand I've ever had in my life, ever. I went out to a bar the week after I got dumped after college on a Sunday in my hometown. There was no one there. There was no one at the bar. Then finally, kid knew my best friend, Matt, I was like, hey man, we're bringing in some girls from Hooters, let's party. It's a real thing that got said to me. In walks seven men and two women. The odds are stacked against Matt and I, but we decide we're gonna have to try to make a move. We go, we start talking to these girls, things are going fine. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just gonna go home because I live at home with my parents, she lives at home with her parents, this is not how this is gonna go, I'm not gonna do this. And she was like, well, my parents are on vacation so you should come back to my house with me. So I did that. I went back to her house, we slept together, and fell asleep. I wake up at five in the morning to a ruckus in her living room, and it's never good when you hear a ruckus. So I go to get up, wearing nothing but Calvin Klein boxer briefs. She grabs me by the shoulder and says, where are you going? And I said, there's someone in your house. I think we left the door unlocked. She goes, no, that's just my dad. I'm like, it's your what? She goes, it's just my dad, but he'll be gone soon. He's in the army, and he gets early shifts, so he'll be out early. And I was like, he's in the what? So I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do, and all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door, and in walks the army officer. So I throw the comforter over my head, and I'm dead fishing, breathing out of the top like this. Because there's a trained killer in the room, ladies and gentlemen. She's talking to her dad about work or something, and finally he decides to leave. As he closes the door, he leaves the family dog in the room. I've evaded a killer, now I've got a canine, and it is just on my chest, sniffing the whole thing. So I'm like, I gotta get out of here, right? I gotta figure out my way. So I go to try to maneuver around the dog, and she stops me and goes, where are you going? I said, I'm gonna leave. And she goes, no, no, my mom still has to get up and go to work. I was like, I thought you said you had an open house. She goes, they leave for vacation tomorrow. I was like, that's not the same thing at all. So the mom gets up to go to work, opens the door to let the dog out, and leaves the door open. So I'm dead fishing under this comforter for eternity, what it feels like at least. And the mom starts yelling upstairs, going, come on, come on, we gotta go. I'm thinking she's yelling for this girl. Turns out this girl has a sister who's also home. <laughs> Nobody was on vacation at all. The sister comes into this girl's room and starts looking for something on like her dresser. You know, sisters share things. And she, I kind of see her stop at the top of the comforter. And she yells downstairs, hey, is there someone in Sierra's bed? And the mom goes, I don't think so. The girl says, I think there is. I hear her mom start coming upstairs. So I just go, if I close my eyes, it's not real. <laughs> so I close my eyes, she walks in the room, and I feel her peel back the comforter. And she is looking at me in my face. And I realize how funny and bizarre this situation is. So I break, and I just go. <laughs> she throws the comforter in my face and goes, yep, there is. Slams the door behind her, leaves. So like, everybody knows I'm here, so I'm going. So I called an Uber to the corner, 
I tapped on the girl's shoulder and I said, I can't remember when I've had a more enjoyable evening. I got up and I went to leave and nobody was downstairs anymore. They must have left. So I start getting ready. I'm going out. I'm walking out the front door. I take one step out and the mom and the sister are getting into their car. And they stop like this. They see me. And I'm walking out and I see them. So I'm like, you got to walk by them. So say something. Just say something. The first thing that came to my mind was, beautiful morning. <laughs> But I was so nervous, my voice cracked. So I walked by them and I went, beautiful morning. And I got into an Uber. And long story short, that's the reason why I hate one night stands. I also hated being single because I hated, like, I hated the aspect of dating. Dating stinks. Dating's awful. I used to buy condoms just to give myself hope. That was it. I, going down the condom aisle is the worst experience in the history of the world. There's like 300 kinds of condoms. And I'm just talking about Trojans. Because if you're buying off-brand condoms, really not the place to cut costs, you know? Not the spot. They all have crazy names. It's like Trojan Charge, Trojan Intense, Trojan Twisted. It's like the guy that works for Bop It. It's like the marketing guy for Trojan. <laughs> There's one condom while I was single that I didn't use, ladies and gentlemen. And I know what you're thinking. And you're right. It is the For Her Pleasure condom. Yeah. Out of solidarity for women. Because there was not a woman in the room when they made the For Her Pleasure condom. You know, it was like four dudes, all named Jared. They're just sitting there for a few hours. Finally, one of them goes, hey, what about ribs? <laughs> Fucking nailed it for it, Jared. We're going to run with that. <laughs> Women are going to love this shit. I went on the Trojan website, ladies and gentlemen, and they have reviews for every condom. And I can promise you, women do not love this shit. I read all of the reviews. All the five-star reviews, all dudes. All dudes. My girl loved it. Best sex I ever had in my life. Fantastic. All the one-star reviews, all women, and they're all pissed, guys. They're so pissed. You don't even have to read their reviews. Read the titles. They're fantastic. Like, they, a lot of them just say, big waste of money. One just said, angry, in all capital letters. <laughs> but my favorite was written by a woman named Diane. She just wrote, why give us hope? And I feel for Diane, man, I do. But how do I put it eloquently? Like, if you put, like, a really nice suit on Steve Buscemi, <laughs> so I was watching TV the other day. <coughs> watching TV the other day, the World Cup came on. I love soccer, guys, I love the World Cup. I was sitting next to the, yeah, okay. And <laughs> I watch the World Cup. And, like, people have really weird sayings when they're from Europe, I've noticed. Like, I was watching the USA-England game, and I was like, what do you think about today? And the guy's like, I don't know. Think, figuring that England could probably get a win here would be pretty good. And I said, I don't know, I think a tie for the U.S. is the best possible outcome. You know, that'd be great for us. And he said, no, a tie is like kissing your sister. <laughs> First of all, no. Is not at all. What a crazy thing to say. I don't think anybody in the history of the world has tied anything and thought, like, I wonder what this feels like, and like went to their sister's room. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that is a loss as far as I'm concerned. Isn't it? It's a loss. Like, if you're a man and you kiss your sister, put one in the loser column. Like, that's it. <laughs> If you are a man at a dimly lit bar, I'm not done, at a dimly lit bar, and you start making out with a girl and you pull away and she's your sister, you should not have the initial reaction of, not the worst thing that could have happened here tonight. Ah, <laughs> oh, man.
You guys are fantastic. I live in Hoboken, like I said. You guys are fantastic. I thank you again for coming out tonight. Thank you, thank you. I love living in Hoboken. Love living in Hoboken. Like I said, crazy shit happens in Hoboken. I'm gonna tell you about another crazy thing that happened to me while I was in Hoboken once. I went out to a party. And it was one of those parties where somebody invites you, but like you don't know a lot of people there. You know, so you get invited by a mutual friend. So I'm walking around this party, don't really know many people. I'm holding a Coors Light against my chest like this, walking around, and I end up at the front door of this party. And it swings open, and three of the scariest men I've ever seen in my life walk into this party. All of them have teardrop tattoos. And it is dead silent. The party's staring at them. They're looking into the party. I'm the closest one there. So I just went, sup fellas, and welcomed them in to a person's apartment that I don't know. I'm just feeding them course lights. They are not saying a word. They haven't even introduced themselves to me. I just keep giving them beer. It'll be fine, give them beer. Finally, they kind of share a look. They look around at each other and they nod. They go, you're coming with us. And I go into the bedroom of a girl I don't know with three men I just met. I know that's a sentence. <laughs> and they roll what I could only assume to be a joint. And against the better judgment of the D.A.R.E. program, <laughs> I smoked that joint with those men. Then they finally gave me their names. I'm in. One dasks me up, goes, some man, I'm Michi. Second one dasks me up, says, I'm Ty. Third one dasks me up and says, I'm Lil Lil. So nice to meet you. I'm John Franklin. <laughs> and we went back out to the party. People are coming nowhere near us. And they're like, what should we do? I said, how about a game of Pong? So we start playing beer Pong with these guys. Nobody's coming near us. I don't give a shit, though, because I am lacing cups left and right. I cannot miss. They start calling me the specialist. That's how good I'm playing. Cup after cup after cup after cup. Finally, I look at them and I say, hey guys, who do you know here? And they go, well, you. <laughs> now we got a problem. So I sort of usher these guys out. And I'm like, we gotta get you out of here, we gotta get you out of here, I don't know anybody here, I explain the situation. They dap me up to leave, and then Michi daps me up. And he pulled me really close, and he said one of the scariest things I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> He whispered into my ear, these streets are mean. You call me if you ever need me. <laughs> and I gave him my real actual phone number. <laughs> a few days later, that was a Saturday night, on a Monday morning, my phone rings. Tim, pick up, oh, hello? He goes, sup? Hey man, how's it going? He goes, nothing. What are we getting into tonight? <laughs> Said, nothing, man. It's a Monday. <laughs> He's like, bet. All right. I'm busy. <laughs> I was like, okay. Sounds good. He said, wish you were with us last night, though. We got into some crazy shit. So I said, gee, I really wish I was there. It's a crazy thing to say back to that. He kind of took a beat and he said, all right, specialist. I'll be catching up with you real soon. And I was like, oh. My God. I finally have a nickname. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. My name is John Franklin. You guys have been fantastic tonight. I want to thank you all for coming out and celebrating my birthday with me. Another hand for everybody coming out. Thank you. Hand for the favorite hand for my friend Sharon Simon, ladies and gentlemen. Now, thank you all so very much. It was an honor of a lifetime to film my special here in New Jersey, and I felt it was only right since we had a band that I close it by singing a song by a band from New Jersey. So I'm going to need you guys to get up, get excited, and have some fun. All right, here we go. I know you know the word.
words, you're gonna have to sing with me, alright? Come on. Thank you, Jersey!